What happens when everything goes poof? Y'all know what I mean when I say that? Poof. We used to say here today and gone tomorrow. But I think we could change that to say here today, gone today. It can be gone just like that. Just like that. We had a record number of people go and buy lottery tickets this week because the Powerball got up to $2 billion. Now, if that was you, don't raise your hand because I know you lost. But somebody woke up a billionaire. And uh, y'all ever think about, wow, wouldn't it be nice to wake up and be a billionaire? Well, also something else happened this week. A man by the name of Sam Bankman Freed began the week with a net worth of over $16 billion. And by midweek, guess what his net worth was? I mean, he it was gone like poof. $16 billion, and then it's gone. And he filed chapter 11. Good luck with finding somebody that'll help him pay that thing off. I think... I guess we could borrow it from China. He could borrow it from China, but somebody from there has already got it. So I don't think that they care. Amen. This, could you imagine everything that you work for and you think that you've arrived and you think you've accomplished is just gone. Just gone, quickly gone. What is the value of a lifetime of work that just goes up in smoke? Lynn and I have friends who uh, all they seem to care about, you know, those people that family means everything to. And they, uh, that was them, and they just wanted to, everything to be built around family, and they started a family of their own, and they had the little toddler there that went out the back and off the deck and into the swimming pool and gone. Have a, my brother looked for uh, that perfect woman to be his bride, I didn't know there'd be a perfect woman for Wade, but he found one, and miracle, miracle, she said yes, and he married a blonde-headed, blue-eyed Southern peach, and she was so sweet, so very sweet, and less than four months later, they met a drunk driver, and she was gone, just like that, poof, gone. I have friends that uh, work hard, They work hard for retirement. They can't wait to get to retirement. They go there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They're working, working. And and the goal is to get to retirement and do what they want and travel. And I've got those friends that get there and then they can't travel. Health changes, things change, and they can't do those things that they dreamed about and worked so hard from. And some of them found out that all that retirement money they worked for, it's gone too. Poof just like that. We have a young man here in the state. Most of y'all know him as an ESPN uh, kind of a celebrity there. He got his start in Snellville, Georgia. He went to a Shiloh High School right by a place where Lynn and I started a, a church down there. He uh, was an all-state player. Matter of fact, he was a uh, the player of the state, defensive player of the state in 5A football for the state of Georgia. He went on to play for the University of Georgia where he got so many awards there. He was uh, all-conference, all-SEC. He was all-American. He was uh, Now he's in the College Football Hall of Fame. All he ever wanted to do was play football and make it to the pros, and he did. He was a first-round draft pick. And he got to the pros, and he was a success. He was doing so very good, but only after a few ball games. He made a tackle like he had made so many times before, but this time it broke his neck. He can walk, he can do all those things, but his football career is over. You may know him as David Pollock. Lives just outside of Athens. Everything that he had worked for, and I mean worked hard for, he got there, but then... In a matter of seconds, poof, it was gone. How quickly things can change. We're going to talk today about a testimony of a man who was the leader of the strongest country in the world. And he, as a king, 
as the sovereign over the land, had everything that his hard work, his, his heart wanted. He had achieved, he had accomplished, and everybody thought he was it. And yet, it came to an end, just like that. Poof, it was gone. And he thought it was so important that he pinned it down, his testimony. You know, everybody has a testimony. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you have a testimony. And Nebuchadnezzar, this king that I'm speaking of, he wanted everyone to know about it. So as you read Daniel 14, you will hear the personal account of Nebuchadnezzar that he wrote down. And by the way, this same account, it's written in Hebrew and Arabic, and it has been kept. It has been found in many different places and many different cultures. They know the story of this king, the king of Babylon, of Mesopotamia. It's even part of the uh, where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found this particular testimony there. You and I would look at it today, and it would look as small as a, a, a Bible pamphlet. But it's the powerful words of his life. Now, Y'all know me, and you know this is not my normal style of preaching, but I, I, I'm going to read to you the entire fourth chapter, 37 verses, because I believe if he felt it so important to write it down, I think that we probably need to hear it in his own words. Are you okay with that? Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll begin today. Father, we pause to say, Oh, how I love you, Lord. How you are so very, very important to me, to all of us. Father, you're the Lord of day and night. All over this earth today, the light shines just like your presence, your wisdom, your power, and your love. Father, you give us breath. You give us eyes to see, ears to hear. You give us an ability to feel and to think and to know. You give us a heart where we can take these things into our lives. And Father, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would be able to hear this testimony. What was so important to him, let our ears hear it. And by, by the way of your Spirit, I pray, oh God, that we would learn the lessons and they would be real and true. Father, this time is your time. We seek to honor you in it. May your will be done. May lives be changed. We thank you not only for the gift of life, but the opportunities that you give us. May we take advantage of those opportunities today. This place, this message, this service, your word, it's all for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Daniel chapter 4 begins by saying, Nebuchadnezzar, the king. Now listen, he says, this is to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth. He says, peace be multiplied to you. Sounds almost like Paul in the New Testament. When you find those epistles that he would write, he would say the salutation there. He'd say, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, uh, writing to you, whether it's at Ephesus or Corinth or, or wherever that may be. But then he would stop and say, peace unto you. Of all the things that we face in life, are there difficulties? Are there worries? Are there hardships? Are there troubles? We face those things. They, they are there in our lives. But let me just ask you, do we let those worries take over us? Do we let those anxieties, those fears, do we let them control us? Do we realize and know that, that everything that we have comes from the almighty I am? Nothing comes to you. He prays for you every morning. While you sleep, He watches over you. His will is there for you. Nothing can come upon you in your life that doesn't go through His sovereign, powerful wisdom hands first. So though it would be natural for you to know the, the pains of life, the, the worries of life, the troubles of the things of this life and as they come upon you. How you can be anxious and how you can wonder about those things. To know that there's a God who loves you, who demands that your will 
will be His best. And His best can be offered to your will. That you can, in your place where you don't know, you can know the one who does. And when you can't, you can know the one who can. And when you think that you're isolated and alone, you know that He promised that He would never leave you or forsake you. Hear His words. He said, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. I love this. Listen to verse 3. He sounds like a good Baptist, don't he? Listen. He said, how great are His signs, how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And His dominion, listen, from one king, speaking of the high king, His sovereignty is from generation to generation. He says, I, can Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. Wow, what a life he lived. He had what he wanted, when he wanted, the best of everything. It was all there. He could rest and be at peace. But yet, you know, sometimes that, that little drop can come down and wreck your peace. He said, I saw a dream which made me afraid. As soon as you think you got life figured out, something will happen. He had a dream and he was afraid. He said, the thoughts on my head, my bed and the visions on my head troubled me. It troubled him to the place that in verse 6, he said, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Now, that makes sense. He's troubled by it. He's scared by it. I'll bring in the very best. I'll tell them the dream. Then they can give me the, the answer of what this dream means. He said, uh, then in verse 7, then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers came in. I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. Now, in, in Daniel 2, he said, you tell me what the dream is. I won't tell you, you tell me, and then I'll know that you can give me the right interpretation. But here he said, I'll tell you the dream. And he did, but they couldn't give him an answer. But then in verse 8, it says, but at last Daniel came before me. He called him by his name Daniel, right? But then he tells him so that everyone would know in his kingdom as he's given the testimony. He says his name is Belshazzar according to the name of his God. Of my God, excuse me. In him is the spirit of the Holy God. You're going to hear that phrase not once, not twice, but you're going to hear it three times. He says in Daniel, the spirit of the Holy God is in him. Now, they were a polytheistic society. They believed in all kinds of God. Everywhere you would turn, you'd see an idol to this, an idol to that. Remember the, the sermon last week, and, and Nebuchadnezzar built that image, 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide of solid, pure gold. And he told everybody to bow before it. They, they were, they were uh, very used to seeing idols to gods. But just an image. But he said, the holy God, the most holy God, his spirit is in Daniel. Everything that is God's, it seems that this God is, is not holding on to it for himself, but he's willing to share it. And Daniel has it, and it's so very evident. So when Daniel came before him, he said, verse 9, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that, the, here it is, the phrase again, the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. No secret troubles you. Explain to me the vision of my dreams that I've seen in its interpretation. So here is Nebuchadnezzar's dream, verse number 10. These were the visions of my head while I was on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. Its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens. Listen to this phrase. And it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Verse 12. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelled in its branches. All flesh was fed from it. I saw in the vision of my head while on my bed. And there was a watcher, a holy one, what you and I would know of as an angel, 
coming down from heaven. This angel cried aloud and said, Chop down the tree. Cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves. Scatter its fruit. Let the beast get out from under it. The birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth. Cut it down. Cut off the branches. Strip it of its leaves. Let the fruit be scattered. Let the beast get out from under it. The bird... Birds, let them find a different place. But he says, the tree is gone. Cut it down. But leave the stump and the roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. All right, y'all watching? Notice how he's been talking about an object, the picture of his dream, a tree. But now notice that the pronoun turns to him. It says in the end of verse 15, and let him graze with the beast on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. Let him be changed. He'll be like a beast of the field. He'll live out in the field and eat grass like a cow. He'll be there in the morning, in the afternoon, and the evening. He'll be wettened by the dew. His hair will grow all over his body. He will become one who knows nothing, just like a, an ox or a cow out into the field. Verse 17. This decision is by the decree of the watchers. The one, the angel. It's his choice that this happened. And the sentence by the word of the holy ones. Why? Here's the great why. You know, God has a reason for everything he allows to happen. Though you don't know it, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a reason. Here is what it says, verse 17. In order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men. There is a God. We need to know it. There is one who rules. We need to acknowledge it. He gives to whoever he will and he sets, o sets over it the lowest of men. Verse 18, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make it known to me, known to me the interpretation. Here's the third time you hear the phrase. But you are able, for the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for a time. And his thoughts troubled him. He stood there before the king. The king told him the story. And the Bible says Daniel was astonished. It's almost as if it caught his breath. And he stood there silent before the king. He didn't say a word. Now that was just a few seconds. But yet, it got his attention. And Nebuchadnezzar led him. And after an hour of just standing there, you can see the great respect Nebuchadnezzar would have had for Daniel. He kind of knew why Daniel wasn't speaking. So he says, here in verse 19, so the king spoke and said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream concerning those, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. He knew that this was bad news. He hated to share it. You can really hear that he, he cared about Nebuchadnezzar. So he gave him the interpretation, verse 20. 
The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached into the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, and which was food for all, under which the beast of the field dwelt, and whose branches the birds of the heavens had their home. It is you, O king. This tree that you saw that could be seen from everywhere on earth, so high and so grand and so powerful, the food of it could feed everyone. It was covering for everyone. You're that one, O king. I wonder if it was kind of like when David stood and Nathan was there who came to him and the prophet Nathan said to, to David, it is you. Now the quietness is there as he gives the explanation. It is you, O king. You have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens. Your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, that what you and I would know as an angel, coming down from heaven and say, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the field, or oh, excuse me, with the dew of heaven. Let him graze with the beast of the field till seven times pass over. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High. God has spoken. Here's what's going to happen, which has come upon my Lord the king. Verse 25. They will drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven. And seven times, that is seven years, shall pass over you. There is a psychological disorder. I ruined the pronunciation of it in the first service. My wife tried to teach me how to pronounce it. It's bo boanthropy. B-O-A-N-T-H-R-O-P-Y. Maybe you can come up after church and tell me how it is. She even tried to explain it to me. She said, boat, B-O-A-T, B-O-A, the A. So I said, just tell me. Tell me. She said, this is a psychological, or she didn't say this. this is, she just told me how to pronounce it. This is a psychological disorder. It is one that's known over. It's happened for years. People have always talked about it. But believe it or not, when someone has this psychological disorder, there's something that goes on in their brain, and they think that they're part of the bovine family. They literally think they're a cow or an oxen. And they'll walk around on all fours and they'll eat grass like a, a cow will eat grass. And this is what God said would happen to Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, it's kind of hard to understand. It's kind of hard to understand, but... Remember the why, verse 17, in order that the living may God, God may know that the most, or excuse me, in order that the living God may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to him however he wishes, and sets over it the lowest of men. He says at the end of verse 25, this will happen, this is the why, until you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. You think you're the king of all, but I'm telling you there's another. And inasmuch, verse 26, as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you. After you come to new, know that heaven rules. Now, as much as Daniel was amazed and astonished by this, don't you know that it got Nebuchadnezzar's attention as well? Probably went to bed thinking about it. Probably talked it over with some of the others. Man, that dream, it just got me. It was so real. I had to know the answer, but I don't know that I like this answer too well. Wow. Well, verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Here's what happened. Now, to this point, we've heard his testimony so far. Now let's hear what actually happened. Verse 29, at the end of 12 months, a year's gone by, maybe he forgot about it. Maybe he wasn't trembling and afraid anymore. Maybe he just thought things are back to normal. Everything's good. 
<clears throat> maybe that what Daniel said, maybe it won't happen. You know, sometimes things that happen to us happen instantly, but sometimes they're like a time-released bomb. It's already been sent, but it will blow up at a different time. Well, 12 months has passed. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 29, it says, He was walking about the royal palace of Babylon, and the king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty, mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? What does that sound like to you? Sounds like pride to me. Pride can eat, sneak up on everybody. I have always said, I will admit readily that pride is my Achilles heel. Pride is the thing that will take me to places that I do not want to go. Pride will make me believe that I can do more than I can. That I am stronger than I am, wiser than I am. Pride will make me think that I am something that I am not. And don't look so sanctimonious because y'all got it too. It's there. It got Adam and Eve, didn't it? Before them, it got Satan, didn't it? And it's reached all of us ever since then. Some say, oh, it's good to have pride. It's good to look at something and see the, the beauty in it, yes. But you need to know and you need to understand and you need to believe and you need to be assured in and you need to make it a part of your life that God allows those things to happen. You are where you are by the grace of God. You have clothes to put on. You have ability to see, to, to listen, to eat, to work simply because of the grace of God. You would not have life. You would not have breath. You would not have sunshine in the sky if God did not allow it. He is the Lord of all. Well, this is what happened. Verse number 31. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. Now hold on. He gave the interpretation to all the wise people that were there so all of them would know it. And when the voice from heaven spoke, he spoke so that all could hear, so that all would know the story, and so all could have the testimony of hearing the voice that this is the reason why this is happening. Hear the voice. A voice fell from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. When God puts up a stop sign, you can't run it. When God says enough, it's enough. And when God says poof, it is gone. It doesn't matter who you are. He is Lord of all. Verse 32, they shall drive you from the men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. Seven times you shall, pa shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men. He ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers, his nails like bird's claws. Could you imagine? Poof. I mean, a man dressed in the, the regal robes of the most powerful man in all the known world. And everyone listening to his every word. Because with his word, people were commanded to follow and obey. But now, this person has been knocked down acting a fool, hands and feet. Clothes meant nothing anymore. Now Babylon was a city of 20 square miles. Literally in the middle of Babylon, the, the city there, was the river Euphrates that went right down the middle of it. It had two great walls around the outside of it. 
There were six gates that were around it. A bridge, one bridge that went over the Euphrates. But really, if you think about 20 square miles, you're thinking about how large of a city this would be. And we do not know where this madman went, but they let him. And maybe around the, the Euphrates River where everything had grown up around it, maybe he slept there, I don't know. Maybe he was kicked out of the city, I don't know, I doubt it. But he acted like a, a cow or an oxen. The hair grew, matted up. The dew of heaven wetting him in the morning. A week, a month, a quarter, a year, seven years. The one that everyone looked to with respect was nothing more than a fool. Most likely his son, or maybe even Daniel and the others who were put over the providences, took care of things out of respect and appreciation for Nebuchadnezzar. Could you imagine people walking around and saying, there goes the king. He's running around. My goodness, he's dirty. Nasty. How the mighty have fallen, have fallen. Well, <clears throat> look what it says in verse 34. And at the end of the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, back to giving his testimony, lifted my eyes to heaven. Oh, those are good words. My understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. What a wonderful word. I looked up to God. I recognized. I believed. My senses were back to me. I honored Him. I praised Him. For it says, His dominion is an everlasting dominion. He is sovereign over all. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain His hand or say to Him, what have you done? It almost sounds like Paul in the great words of Philippians 2. And God has given Him a name that is above a name of, of every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Preacher, you sound like you think Nebuchadnezzar got saved. Well, amen. It's the greatest thing that could happen to any person that has been given breath to come to know that there is a God, that there is a God of love who cares. And He'll do for you what only He can do. And he's more than willing to do it. And we go through life and we worry and we fret because we don't know and we don't understand and we can't. The things of this world who seem so big and seem so, they, they just devastate us because we just walk through and, and we, we say, I wish I knew what to do. But yet the spirit of the living God lives within us as well as it did in Daniel. The Holy Spirit is there to guide you. And He promises that He would never leave you. He would never forsake you. And the peace of God it can be offered. If you've got fear and anxiety and worry and you're afraid, just understand that's your reaction, but that should not be your lifestyle. You have the privilege of adjusting and, and, and getting your mind set upon Him. To walk through one day in the darkness of worry, rather than in basking in the presence of peace. That's not on God, that's on you. And by the way, that will be the privilege of heaven one day, and we're supposed to be practicing how to live that way now. Listen to his words. At the same time my reason returned to me, 
And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors, my nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom. And excellent majesty was added to me. But I don't believe he was the same king to you. They took a bath, they cut his hair. They put the regal robes of, of majesty and sovereignty back upon him. Everyone was so glad that he was back. They restored everything to him. But there was something different about him. Verse number 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> I praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth, his ways are justice. But listen in the last part of verse 37. Holy Spirit, let us hit us with humility to bring us down to the lowest place where we can see the greatness of your glory. Look what it says. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Those who walk in pride. Just because your kingdom may be smaller doesn't mean that you think you're the king of your kingdom. Just because you don't have the riches of Nebuchadnezzar doesn't mean that you don't bow to riches. Just because you do not have the counselors and the soothsayers and all those people there to give you help and direction does not mean that there's something beyond them and that you need a word that's beyond anything of the wisdom of this world, but it's offered. If you will humble yourself and believe and know and trust that this holy God loves you and wants what's best for you and is there for you to care and to guide, to love and to help. We could dream of such things, but it's the reality of the believer in Christ. One day, we'll have, I pray you've already had the acknowledging on earth, so you'll have the acknowledging in heaven. Preacher, you think Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in heaven? I do. I do. I think he got, I love that New Testament word, saved to the uttermost. I love that. And when you get there, we understand that because of all the things that we've done in service for the King of Kings, we will be given crowns, but we will take those crowns and we will lay them at his feet because all glory and honor are due him. And I think Nebuchadnezzar will have a smile on his face when he comes and says, Lord, thank you for loving me enough to let me eat grass and sleep on the ground and act like a fool so that I can know you, the living God. I found the end of myself so I could find the all of you. And Nebuchadnezzar could take those crowns off and lay them at his feet and say, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what God wants for you. He wants to say, King of kings. He wants you to say, Lord of lords. By the way, you have a testimony. If you know Jesus Christ, you have a testimony. Nebuchadnezzar thought it was so important that he wrote it down, had it published, that all people's Nations and languages would hear it. But God's given you a testimony so that those around you can hear it. And today, whether you're in this room or whether you're watching online, if you hear my voice, I pray that you hear the voice of the Holy God calling to you. The drawing, the love, that if you would believe and that if you would repent, you could have everything that a heart could even think about or desire. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, nor hath even entered into the heart of man those things that God has prepared for those who love him. Are you willing for him to be your sovereign? your king, 
your Savior, to remove your sins as far as the east is from the west? Are you ready for God to love you with an everlasting love? To never leave you? To lead you in wisdom and truth? It's there. It's there. Preacher, that sounds good too, too good to be true. If it, it would be if we weren't talking about God. <laughs>